Well, it's Monday. We are turning again to the Gospel of Mark this, this week, to Mark 13. And there is an unmistakable urgency about these final chapters. You may not realize this since we are uh, taking a whole year to study this Gospel, little by little, but Mark moves at breakneck speed. Uh, it only takes 45 minutes to read the Gospel in a single sitting might be something to do on your own or with a friend um, between now and the end of the semester, maybe several times, but you get much, a much greater sense of the pace of the gospel if you read it through in one sitting. Mark starts right at the beginning with the beginning of Jesus' public ministry and then rushes forward to the last week of our Savior's life. And then, remarkably, the story gets even more intense Jesus is welcomed by multitudes at his triumphal entry. He goes into the temple courts and he drives out the money changers. He tells a prophetic parable in which, see if this sounds familiar, the beloved son of a great king is sent from a far kingdom and gets put to death. That's the intensity of the end of Mark. Even before you get to the cross, Jesus is telling a parable, which is the story of his own sacrifice. There is a sense at the end of the gospel of life and death. And we definitely get that in the beginning of chapter 13, when Jesus prophesies not only the destruction of the temple, but the end of the world. Wars, rumors of wars, false Christs leading people astray, nation rising against nation, heaven and earth shaken, families torn asunder, the sun turning black, stars falling from the sky, tribulation, the greatest suffering the world has ever seen, and faithful followers of Christ will suffer the most of all, the hatred of the world. And yet in the midst of this, Jesus says, do not be afraid. Because before the world ends, you will have an opportunity to do what you were made to do. And that is to testify to the grace of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Now you need to know that wherever faithful Christians truly follow Christ, there is the same sense of absolute urgency that Jesus had about sharing the gospel. We don't know when the world will end, either for any particular person or for this tired old world generally. But we do know because Jesus said it over and over again that the end is coming soon, and that in the meantime, we are called to do everything we can to make sure as many people as possible get a definite opportunity to repent of sin and receive the gift of eternal life in Jesus. Now, if I'm right that you see this sense of urgency about evangelism, wherever you find faithful Christians, then for one thing, that's a good test for us of our faithfulness to Christ. But also this, you won't be surprised to learn that the Protestant reformers were serious about sharing the gospel. During the president's chapels this year, I've been going back to the Reformation that started 500 years ago and trying to show its relevance for today. And the Protestant reformers were passionate about all kinds of things that we're passionate about at Wheaton College today. Things I hope you will always be passionate about. Christ-centered liberal arts learning, the life of the mind, reading and studying the scriptures, caring for the poor, welcoming refugees, standing before God on the merits of Christ, not on the basis of your own spiritual performance. These are, these are the kinds of practices you can build an entire life upon, as the reformers did. What I want to do this morning is challenge, challenge you also to be passionate about sharing your faith. Will you? tell people about Jesus? Will you get involved in starting new churches? Will you support missionaries through your prayer and through your financial giving? Just a couple of days ago, I was in Denver with some Wheaton alums, and we were talking together about the immense privilege that we have experienced in supporting fellow Wheaties who are doing gospel work around the world. Mrs. Reichen and I have supported some of our Wheaton friends now for 30 years. 
Uh, I hope you get the same kind of opportunity to support your own friends in the gospel work that God has given them to do. That's the same kind of commitment that John Calvin made. If you had worshiped at his church in Geneva, Switzerland, in St. Peter's Cathedral, back in the day, you would have definitely sensed his commitment to world evangelization. And I say this because Calvin closed every one of his sermons with basically the same prayer for the missionary work of the gospel. In fact, one scholar has estimated that if you had been a regular part of Calvin's congregation during those years, you might have heard this prayer more than 2,500 times. It had a huge influence on the work of that church. And Calvin typically prayed that God would grant his grace not only to us, but to all people and all nations of the earth, that he would bring back all souls from the bondage of darkness to the way of salvation, and that for that purpose he would raise up true and faithful ministers of his word who seek not their own profit and glory, but only the advancement of his holy name, that his glory may shine over all and the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ be increased and advanced more and more. This was Calvin's prayer. What a prayer that is. It's a prayer for Christ and for his kingdom. We usually associate the Protestant Reformation with Europe, but as far as the reformers were concerned, this gospel was never just for people in their own place. It was always for the entire world. Now, Martin Luther, for example, in the preface to his New Testament, said that before he died, Jesus appointed and ordained that after his death, his gospel should be preached throughout the world, that all who believe might receive life and righteousness and salvation. Calvin had the same commitment. He wanted all nations to know Christ. He, he prayed for their, their salvation. And, but he also knew that people would never believe in Jesus unless they heard about Jesus. And so he was fervent in his prayer that God would raise up missionaries and evangelists to preach the gospel. For Calvin, this kind of evangelism started at home. He believed that God had called him, to some degree against his own desires, to preach the gospel in the city of Geneva. He talked about the ministry there. He said, God has opened a door for us so that we might introduce Christ. And that's what Calvin did. He introduced Christ to people by preaching the Bible, faithfully teaching the scriptures, sometimes as many as 20 times a week. And he saw people coming to faith in Christ, growing in their daily discipleship. But Calvin didn't want to stop there. He wanted this gospel to spread from that city to every city. He believed fervently that Jesus Christ has been given authority over heaven and earth, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, God's word will do, his, do its work wherever it is proclaimed. And Calvin had a special burden for his native France. It's a country he never refer, returned to, but he never stopped loving. And eventually, I'll tell you a little bit of the story later on, but eventually his church sent hundreds of missionaries to every part of the French-speaking world. Now, one historian comments that Geneva became a dynamic center or nucleus from which vital missionary energy radiated out into the world beyond. I read that sentence, I can't help but think that this has often been true of Wheaton College. This has been a dynamic center or nucleus from which vital missionary energy radiates out into the world. This should be our fervent prayer for our campus today and in, for the coming generation. That kind of prayer and that kind of commitment was fully in keeping with, with Calvin's belief, and here is how he described it, that God had commanded the messengers of the gospel to go a distance in order to spread the message of salvation in every part of the world. Praise God, some of you have been going a distance just this last week, a distance to some city in the United States, to prison somewhere, to some foreign country. This is the call of the gospel in every, in every generation that we would not just stay in our own place, that we, would, that we would go the distance. And Calvin's missionaries from Geneva went the distance. Many of them were refugees who had first come to that city for asylum, they were trained in ministry, then they went out to other places to preach the gospel. Maybe some of you remember an amazing fact I shared with you back in January that 
Geneva, as a city of 10,000, welcomed 10,000 refugees. And that generous hospitality created amazing opportunities for people to hear the gospel. We see the same thing happening in the world today, particularly among Muslim refugees and other immigrants who are moving from country to country. And, and in every place, <coughs> there are Christians there to welcome them and to serve them in the name of Jesus. Last week while you were away, excuse me, just struggling with a little cough this morning. Last week while you were away, the National Association of Evangelicals was on campus for board meetings. And one of the things we heard about, including from Wheaton alumnus Matthew Sorens, is just story after story of Muslims coming to Christ because in every place where they go, there are the people of God there to welcome them and to serve them in the name of Jesus. Something similar happened in Geneva, and some of those refugees that first came there for safety then took a risk and left the city and went to dangerous places with the gospel. The results of their work are amazing. We know this uh, from the historical records, for example, from Geneva's register of the Company of Pastors and other historical sources. In 1555, there were only five evangelical churches in France. Four years later, there were over 100. And three years after that, more than 2,000. This is the mathematics of missions. It's never just addition. You're going to have to know multiplication. This is a story of the growth of the church in a few short years increasing by a factor of 400, simply as the gospel was preached. And as the people of France were able to hear the gospel in their own language and were offered freely the gift of, of salvation through the death and resurrection of Christ alone. And so in the, by 1562, near the end of Calvin's life, there were churches and house churches in Paris, Lyon, Aix-en-Provence, La Rochelle, Nantes, Orléans, Rouen, city after city, one new congregation after another, some of them as large as 8,000 members. And it was all because people were willing to go a distance with the gospel. And part of what I want you to know, by the grace of God, is that you have the same privilege. You have the same opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder what opportunities you had over spring break and how you took advantage of them. If you're like me, sometimes you think of a better way to take evangelistic advantage after you've had the conversation than during the conversation. But each time we take a step forward in sharing our faith, we become better equipped to address the next conversation, to become more and more effective in our witness for the gospel. What opportunities is God giving us as a campus in Chicago? What opportunities might you have for Jesus this summer? Sometimes all it takes is a simple conversation. I love the story that one of our staff members told me a few years ago. She was at a local park. She saw what turned out to be a Chinese woman looking after her young daughter, and they struck up a conversation. Before long, she invited the woman to study the Bible with her. It was something that, as an atheist, she had never done before. The two of them studied the Bible together. Then the woman got involved in a women's Bible study. And uh, eventually she decided she, she didn't want to go to an early morning Bible study. She asked if, if there are any Christians that study the Bible in the evening. She switched over to an evening Bible study. And um, what, what, what my friend will never remember, never forget is the look of overwhelming joy that she saw on her friend's face when she came running up to her in the parking lot after school one day. She knew even before she said anything that she had received Jesus Christ for her salvation. And she explained what had happened. She had been in a Bible study the night before. She had heard the call of Christ to forgive enemies. And when she heard that call, she knew that was something she could never do out of her own strength. It, it, for her to do that, it would have to be from someone or something outside of her. And so she, she put her trust in God that night. She went home from the Bible study asked, I guess, what might have been customary in her tradition or her culture. She asked her husband for permission to become a Christian. He said yes right away because he saw all the ways that her life was already changing. She stayed up all night reading the Bible, all the next morning, all the next afternoon, and then she ran up and told her friend what had happened. She said, she said, it is like I have new eyes 
It is like everything is in color now when it was colorless before. My hope for you, my prayer for you, is that you will know the joy of helping people see the world in gospel color. And it happened so, so simply, it was just reaching out to somebody in the neighborhood, starting a friendship, inviting for an opportunity to study the Bible, and then praying that God would do his work. Ask God to give you friendships that count for the kingdom. Open the Bible with people. Share the gospel through your personal witness. Pray as Jesus taught us to pray that, that the Lord of the harvest would send out more workers. Proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. The world still needs the gospel. There is so much gospel work to be done. I think of the prayer that Calvin had 500 years ago and how relevant it still is today. He, he prayed that God would show himself by his grace to dwell not only in one city or in a little handful of people, but that he would reign over all the world, that everyone may serve him and worship him as he deserves. See, that's the kind of expansive prayer that we ought to be offering as we go to prayer, not just for God to do a little thing in one place, but for him to do many things in many places that the gospel would be advanced. Now, I don't want to, to minimize how challenging it can be to share the gospel. On the one hand, it's the simplest thing in the world. Sometimes all it, starts is, all, all it takes is just starting a good friendship and then sharing your life with somebody, a, a life that includes prayer and Bible study and going to church and just the ordinary rhythms of, of the Christian life. If Christ is living in you, then when you share your life, you can't help but share Jesus too. It can be that simple. But I need to tell you that it can also cost you everything. And that's part of the burden that Jesus felt as he was commissioning his disciples to testify to his grace. He knew how costly it would be. He, he was looking forward to the end of the world. He, he told them they would have a chance to share the gospel, but he also talked about being delivered to prison, put on trial, even suffering unto death. That's what makes this message so urgent. It's not just a matter of life and death for those who hear the gospel, but also for those who proclaim it. When we see that kind of suffering, it reminds us that Satan hates the gospel more than anything in the world and will do anything he can to stop it. Here is how Calvin explained what we are up against. He said, today, when God wishes his gospel to be preached in the whole world so that the whole world may be restored from death to life, he seems to ask us for the impossible because we see how greatly we are resisted everywhere. And, with, and how Satan works against us so that all roads are blocked. Calvin faced a lot of those roadblocks in his own city. I mentioned that uh, his church sent out hundreds of missionaries, but it was decades of prayer before that church sent out even one missionary. Calvin was just praying about this year after year. Missions was not high on the agenda for his congregation. It took a lot of prayer. I, I have the same concern for the evangelical church today. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like people have the same sense of burden for missions as they may have had in an earlier generation. Calvin saw that in his time. He just kept preaching and he kept praying. By 1555, it was only a little trickle of evangelists that went out, but eventually it became a mighty flood. The church was sending out as many as 100 missionaries in a single year. Now, not all of them had a terribly good life expectancy. As they went out to preach the gospel, many of them were risking their lives. In fact, when Calvin wrote to encourage the churches in France, he would not mention their true locations or use the real names of their, their missionaries. He wrote in a kind of code. He took the kind of precautions that, that many of us take today when we communicate with gospel workers in places like Vietnam and Saudi Arabia. And the missionaries took a lot of precautions too. They often conducted their worship services in private homes or they went out into secret places in the woods. And despite the precautions, churches were sometimes discovered, some believers taken hostage, sometimes entire congregations, and there were martyrs, including five young theology majors seized in Lyon, thrown into prison, put to death. Their lives were for the glory of God. Here's what Calvin wrote in a famous letter to them delivered before they, they perished. Let enemies do their utmost. They shall never be able to bury that light which God has made to shine in you 
For this end, that all glory may be given to him, and that whether we live or die, all may be to his honor and glory. Whether we live or die. Remember, as we worship in anticipation of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, and as you share the gospel, as you have the opportunity, remember you are following in the footsteps of your Savior, who, before calling you to go a distance for him, went a distance for you, coming down from heaven so that we would know the good news of God's grace, suffering unto death for our salvation, Satan doing everything he could to tempt and to murder Jesus, to destroy him forever. But, but God was victorious in that fight. The Bible says he disarmed the rulers and authorities. He put them to open shame. He triumphed over them as he nailed the debt of our sin to the cross. And now we are called to go a distance for that savior to follow the risen Christ, proclaiming the good news, whatever hardships we may face. I wanna ask the concert choir to begin assembling for their final song. And as they come forward, I wanna give you words of John Calvin that can give you courage. This is the conclusion of a letter that Calvin wrote to a church plant off the coast of France. And it was a letter that was carried by the man who became the church planter, Philibert Hamelin, who was faithful to his calling unto death. He suffered martyrdom just four years later. Here's what Calvin wrote to encourage Philibert Hamelin, his church in France, and every faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Take courage. Dedicate yourselves wholeheartedly to God who has purchased you through his own son at such cost. Surrender your body and soul to him, showing that you hold his glory more precious than anything this world has to offer. Value the eternal salvation prepared for you in heaven more than this fleeting life. And we will pray that the good Lord will complete what he has begun in you, that he will advance you in all spiritual blessings and keep you under his holy protection.